the collaboration between the universities in West Virginia and the University of Arkansas, in my opinion, has been extremely productive over the last year and a half uh, with regard to cyber infrastructure, learning from each other in terms of what type of capabilities we have, what type of problems that we want to solve, and how do we do that using advanced cyber infrastructure. Uh, it's, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and then as Jack said, that is not actually, a, that is not a made-up story. As I was sitting in the Cisco presentation this morning, I got the email that said I've been tenured and promoted. So, uh, it that I did these slides or at least touched them up yesterday. So literally that was true as of yesterday. Um, I'm, I'm also the faculty campus champion for cyber infrastructure at the University of Arkansas. Basically what this entails is essentially having me learn what type of computational um, tools people use on campus and trying to promote the use of high performance computing in order to solve some of the problems that they might have. So when we first started working on this a couple of years ago, um, we knew that there were myself and basically an actual, basically I was in mechanical engineering, there was somebody in physics who did density functional theory, there was somebody in chemistry who did ab initio quantum chemistry, and then there was a geospatial sciences group. Um, we didn't really know too much outside of that point in terms of who uses high performance computing on campus. And uh, as part of the CI Train project, we've been able to pull people in from electrical engineering, from industrial engineering. There's a number of people in industrial engineering, um, again, from the Cisco presentation this morning, uh, the world headquarters of Walmart is only 15 miles from the university. Uh, so there's a number of people in electrical and industrial engineering who do RFID, who do smart grid, who do some of these technologies that can take advantage of the cyber infrastructure on campus. So what I'm going to talk about today is basically molecular dynamic simulations and probably most importantly why I need advanced cyber infrastructure resources to do the type of science that I want to do on here. So. Uh, first and foremost, what is molecular dynamic simulations? Um, kind of the definition that I like is basically MD simulation involves the explicit, basically simulation of atomic scale particles, including atoms and molecules. Uh, so for example, if we wanted to model a DNA, uh, basically double helix system, uh, we individually identify atoms within that DNA. Uh, and when we do that, we actually have three choices in terms of how we want to model the system. The first of which is we can do this in a static sense, so we can use molecular mechanics, or sometimes known as molecular statics type calculations. This is an athermal calculation used to find the minimum energy configuration of this collection of atoms. So essentially what we do is we try to move the atoms around collectively so that they find a minimum energy configuration uh, based on the interaction potentials between those individual atoms. From a numerical standpoint, what this uses is we need some level of numerical algorithm to do this. So typically we use some sort of steepest descent algorithm or a conjugate gradient algorithm to essentially find the minimum basically put in this n-dimensional potential energy surface, essentially. Now, if we don't want to do it athermally, if we wanted to model the trajectory of a set of atoms in time, we can use molecular dynamic simulations. So essentially molecular dynamics, we want to simulate the motion of atoms in time at a desired temperature and pressure in our system. So from a numerical standpoint, what we're basically doing is we end up solving a coupled set of first order differential equations. And so we, do, we need basically numerical integration to solve these equations of motion and we want to do it as efficiently as possible. And then third, uh, we could do what are known as basically Monte Carlo methods. Monte Carlo methods is another method to sample a number of equilibrium configurations and we're going to do this via random displacements. So essentially what we do is we use many different random number generators to randomly select an atom, randomly move that atom, and then decide did I lower the energy of the structure by randomly moving that atom that I randomly chose. If I did, then I'm going to keep the new structure. If I didn't, I actually made the energy go up. I randomly can sometimes also accept that structure even though the total energy went up. So you randomly uh, probe different equilibrium configurations for your collection of atoms. So these are the three terminologies that you'll typically see under the umbrella term atomistic simulations. Today what I'm going to talk about predominantly is basically molecular dynamic simulations. So uh, why? Why would we want to do this? There's been a number of presentations that have talked about probing atomistic type information. Uh, what, what, what I like is basically experiments do not often provide sufficient resolution to study discrete atomic motions in response to a set of boundary conditions. 
Um, simulations also allow, allow the exploration of material behavior uh, under boundary conditions that are not possible from an experimental standpoint or a material system that is currently unknown. So we can use this to maybe develop, potentially develop new materials. So the example that I like is here is uh, basically everybody has heard of carbon nanotubes uh, on here. This is a TEM image of a multi-wall carbon nanotube and this is kind of a cross section so you can see the, in, hopefully you can see the individual layers of the carbon nanotube walls. But from an experimental standpoint, this is basically the best that we can get from a resolution, that, that, a picture that gives us atomic level resolution of what this multi-wall carbon nanotube looks like. This is what it looks like in real life where you have these hexagonal structures of your carbon nanotube. Now what we can do in basically simulation is we can say what happens if we pull on the carbon nanotube? What happens if we were able to grip both ends of the carbon nanotube and pull on it to see how it breaks. That's extremely challenging to do from an experimental standpoint. It's something that we can do by applying appropriate boundary conditions in our basically simulation environment. So if we apply forces right here, we can study the formation and the movement of defects in our system. This is known as a stone whales transformation where you go from four six-sided rings to two five-sided rings and two seven-sided rings. This is the basically defect formation process in a carbon nanotube and eventually this will begin to move or basically migrate under the application of that stress inside the carbon nanotube. So we have this type of resolution basically computationally whereas we have this type of resolution from an experimental standpoint. So essentially how does it work? In the, basically in the molecular dynamics method, what we essentially do is treat each atom as just a point mass in space. So we've seen a number of chemistry and physics based presentations. We take this complicated situation over here we, where we have atomic nuclei and we have electrons or electron densities around those atomic nuclei and we simplify that situation. We basically say that we're going to simplify this as two point masses in space and we're going to call these point masses atoms. Now how we may write an interaction between those two atoms, we essentially define an interatomic potential. The interatomic potential is where all the accuracy of your MD simulation is. The point of the interatomic potential is to basically mimic what would happen if you explicitly modeled the electron distributions in your system and how those electron distributions between these two atoms essentially, basically, essentially interact with each other. If we can define this inner atom potential, then the force between these two atoms is simply then just a derivative as a function of distance between those two. Now, once we have the force in our system, at its core, basically molecular dynamics is essentially just solving F equals NA, basically Newton's second law. So once we have the force, we know the mass of our atom, uh, we can basically just apply Newton's second law to uh, find the, out the acceleration and then once we have the acceleration, we know the acceleration is just the second derivative with respect to time of the position. So we end up with a second order, basically differential equation. Well, we can basically numerically integrate that to find the new atomic positions in our system, to be able to track the trajectory of our atom in time as a function of the forces that are acting on that atom. And of course, those forces come from all of the other atoms around it. So this is what we're doing from a computational perspective. Now, in reality, we usually augment F equals MA by additional terms so that we can couple the motion of the atom to a thermostat so that we can control temperature and an actual barostat so we can control pressure in our system. Oops. All right. So as I said, all of the accuracy in our calculation is wrapped up in this interatomic potential. So the interatomic potential provides the constitutive law uh, that defines how atoms basically interact with each other and our accuracy is dependent, basically dependent on the accuracy of this model. So for example, if we have some sort of polymeric or biomolecule system, this is what our, this is kind of a basically schematic of what our system might look like. We may need to account for the fact that two atoms that have a covalent bond can stretch basically from each other. We might need to account for the fact that three atoms that are separated by covalent bonds can bend basically relative to each other. We might need to account for the fact that a set of four atoms can rotate around a common axis relative to each other. So all of these individual effects have to be incorporated into the total inner top potential of the system. 
Then you can add any, anything else that you basically want. We may have non-bonded interactions. So an atom that might be in this triplet right here may feel the presence of these atoms up here, even though it's not directly, basically covalently bonded to it. So each different material class, whether we're dealing with metals or ionically bonded material or covalently bonded material, we'd be able to write an interatomic potential that describes how atoms in that material system basically interact with each other. All right, so why do we need advanced cyber infrastructure to do this? We've got a couple of problems with regard to molecular dynamic simulations. First of all is materials are made up of a lot of atoms on there. Avogadro's number is 10 to the 23rd. Um, on here, uh, and in, from an MD standpoint, forces and atom positions have to be updated at each integration time step. And I'll talk in a second, time step ends up becoming a problem as well. So just as a quick, basically mathematical example, say we have a small cube of face-centered cubic copper, and say that cube is one micron on a side, so smaller than the width of your hair on here. If you do a little quick math, that comes out to 84.7 billion copper atoms in that one micron cubed on here. That is a lot of atoms from an atomistic standpoint on here. So the solution to this is we want to use parallel decomposition techniques or some sort of parallel simulation technology in order to break our simulation apart into bits and pieces. And we can take what used to be our one micron cubed and we can do this by via either sending atoms, we can break the atoms up equally and send them to each of the processors or the cores in our system, or we can break the domain up equally and send each domain into individual cores in our system. Usually an atom that might be over here in a very large model doesn't particularly care what happens with an atom over here. So we can do these in basically parallel with each other and bring all that information back when it's done to form our complete model. So we can take advantage of some of the high performance computing resources. Um, I can't really see this picture, so I don't think you can uh, either. This is Star of Arkansas. This is one of our two clusters that we have at the University of Arkansas. This is our older, uh, basically, Dell system. This is on the order of, uh, it's between 1,200 and 1,500 processors on there. Our new IBM system has uh, close to 1,500 cores as well on there. So to my knowledge, the current world record from MD simulation is 320 billion atoms on there. So this is 84.7. You're talking uh, four microns by one micron by one micron type sample on here. This is done with an embedded atom method potential. So this is a very accurate potential uh, for modeling metals, especially transition metals. Uh, and this was done by Tim German, who's at Los Alamos National Labs, using 131,072 cores on the IBM Blue Gene L system at Lawrence Livermore National Labs. So when, Lauren, when basically Blue Gene L was installed at Lawrence Livermore, uh, basically Tim uh, was given uh, exclusive access to it to essentially bang on it. So what he essentially did is put together the largest problem he could possibly conceivably think of from an MD standpoint and wanted to see that if basically Blue Gene L could solve that problem. Um, so, most MD simulations are on the order of hundreds of thousands to maybe low single, basically, basically low single, actual millions of atoms. Okay. All right. Now, while scale allows us to do larger subsets of atoms, there's also things that we need to think of from an engineering standpoint in terms of how scale plays into these calculations. Uh, if we wanted to model a material that had a microstructure, so if we wanted to model something that had interfaces in it or a length scale associated with those interfaces, basically we need to make sure that the statistics of those microstructures that we model in atomistics are representative of what would happen experimentally on here. And that's not necessarily be a, basically capable of being done with small systems. So say, for example, you take the table leg on here and you polish it up and put it under a microscope it would look like this. You'd have what's known as the actual polycrystalline environment. Each of these individual regions here that's kind of circled by the green regions here, those are known as grains. Now, this, in our basically MD standpoint, the diameter of these grains are on the order of basically nanometers. In real life, uh, in, in a real coarse grain sample, those are on the order of microns in size. But people have, cap have the capabilities of making metals with nanocrystalline scale actual microstructures. And what they're interested in is those are very difficult to test experimentally. They're very difficult to produce. But we can study their basically physical behavior using atomistic simulations. But in order to make a one-to-one -one or good quantitative comparison 
between our atomistic simulations and experiment, we need to make sure that the microstructural statistics are appropriate from our MD simulation. So suppose we were only able to, to do a simulation cell that had 20 grains in it. Our statistics might look like this. So in reality, a random metal sample should have a log normal distribution of the grain sizes and it should have what's known as an actual McKenzie, basically random distribution of the grain boundary orientations. So each of these grains has a different orientation. So you have, may have one grain as a crystal region like this, but another grain as a crystal region like that, and they come together, they form some sort of planar defect on there. There should be a random distribution of those if the sample is big enough, and a log normal distribution of the grain size. This is what happens when we only have, I think there was only 17 grains yeah, less, I think there are 17 grains in this sample here. If we have a much larger model where our simulation here is on the order of 20 million atoms, we can have hundreds of grains in our sample. And if we do that, and we look at the distribution of our grain sizes and the distribution of our grain boundary angles, we find that we match very well what would be predicted or basically has been observed from experiments. So now we can do a more quantitative one-to-one -one comparison between our simulations and what would be done experimentally. Now, as I said, if we can do that, then we can study, for example, the actual mechanical properties of these actual nanocrystalline materials. We can apply some sort of physical boundary conditions. We can place a basically some sort of tensile deformation to our system. We can generate mechanical stress-strain deformation, stress-strain curves, uh, and then we can plot the strength for example, is a function of grain size in our system. And so this behavior here is known as grain size strengthening. The smaller and smaller and smaller we make our grains, the stronger and stronger and stronger the material gets, but it has a limit. And that limit is typically on the order of 15 to 30 nanometers in size where we start to see some sort of softening response. And we can predict this from a simulation standpoint and people have started to observe this experimentally with very complicated, very basically unique experiments that they can do. All right, so problem two, so basically problem one, basically problem one was actual length scale. Problem two is time scale. So atoms at temperature vibrate at extremely high frequencies. So when we integrate our series of first order differential equations to solve F equals MA, uh, we need an integration time step on the order of one femtosecond. So that means that if I wanted to do one nanosecond of material behavior, I need to do millions of time steps in my actual integration procedure. And so most molecular dynamic simulations are restricted to nanoseconds of worth of material behavior. At most, I have seen tens of microseconds worth of material behavior. Now, one of the things that we can do for very special, uh, properly posed problems is we can do what's known as parallel replica dynamics. And this, again, takes advantage of a high-performance computing architecture. So we can take our original problem, which is just simply represented by a ball in a two-energy well here, and we can replicate that energy well across the end processors that we have in our system. So we can just make a copy, 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 copy on, and, and, and on basically 100 processors if we want. Then through some sort of basically equilibration procedure, we can make sure that those copies are not identical to each other. They are statistically different from each other. But all the same starting configuration, the ball is in one potential well. Then we run our simulation. And we run our simulation simultaneously on all end processors. S suppose on processor number 47, something happens. Our system jumps from one energy well accidentally into a different energy well. Once we recognize that occurrence, we can stop everything. We move all of our calculations, all of our end calculations to that state, and we basically replicate again and move on. So that means that the total time that my simulation actually occurred for this instance to occur is not just the time for this, what, what actually happened here on processor 47, but it's the time that happened on processor 47 times the number of actual, um, basically actual replicas that you made in your system. So you can accelerate your MD simulation for certain problems. Now, this only works when you have very discrete event type actual calculation. So if you have, for example, a perfect crystalline surface and just a single atom sitting on a, a actual hole in that surface, the basically vibrational motion of that atom jumping from one local position to a next local position would be a uncoupled discrete event. Yeah. So 
gets a basically minor but definitely measurable benefit, and, but it's not applicable to all types of problems. Okay. Third, what do I do with all this data? So we've heard a couple of talks today about I'm generating terabytes worth of data. MD simulation can easily generate terabytes worth of data if you want to um, on here. So typically this is what the output looks like. Generally have a time step. This particular calculation was done with half a million atoms, 489,000 atoms. These are my simulation box bounds. And then I have a whole bunch of information corresponding to each individual atom in my system. And within the same output file, I may have the same 489,000 lines of output data 100 times, because I outputted 100, 100 at, at every 100 time steps or something on here. So in this particular data, this first column represents the atom number, so a unique number identified for each atom in the system. This is the atom type, so obviously I was doing an alloy or some sort of polymeric system where I have multiple different types. Uh, the next three columns are x, y, and z position of the given atom. Uh, and then the last two columns are just scalar data that I can use to visualize or color the, the atoms in my system. So this column is actually potential energy, and this column is known as centrosymmetry. Centrosymmetry is used for crystalline systems uh, as a measure of local disorder of the lattice. So an actual central symmetry value of zero, like that one, that one's close, that one's even closer, would mean that that atom is in a perfect crystalline arrangement. Anything that's not zero means there's some sort of defect nearby. So we need tools to not only visualize, but also to sort, view, and analyze all of this basically data, all of this data so that we can actually visualize our science and maybe learn from what we have to better direct our simulations. So um, the actual solution is we do need these tools. There are a number of tools out there. This is just a, a small list. We've heard of a couple of other ones today as well. Um, there's some commercial tools out there, things like Material Studio, things like Insight, et cetera. Um, there's also open source codes, free open source codes out there, things like VMD, Ovito, Atomi, Paraview, Visit, uh, et cetera. All of them basically do the same thing. You essentially take your initial raw data, you make geometric primitives out of it, uh, and then you render it in some way uh, to basically create your shape and visualize your system. Now for atomistic simulation, or basically molecular dynamic simulations, all of the geometric primitives are, are pretty simple. They're just spheres. The spheres can be different size, but essentially they're spheres meant to represent each individual atom in the system. Um, so just a, a, a couple of snapshots of some of these. This is Paraview. I know this is one that I think Jack has played around with here. Uh, this is an actual weather simulation in Paraview. This is one of their example files that they have. Um, I use Paraview to do some phase field modeling, which is an actual mesoscale code that I'm not talking about today. Uh, this is VISIT. Basically, VISIT is distributed by Lawrence Livermore. Again, very similar to Paraview in the sense that you can read a whole bunch of different data files into your system, and you can visualize your data in a whole bunch of different ways. You can visualize it either discreetly, or you can visualize it in a contour sense. Both, uh, basically, Paraview and visits are, are general visualization tools. They can basically, uh, basically visualize unstructured data and structured data equally as well. Mm -hmm. Now, for atomistic and molecular simulation, there are a couple of specialized visualization tools out there. One of them is called VMD. This is distributed by the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, this is, was originally designed to do biological systems, but has been extended to kind of be a general atomistic, basically, visualization tool. Uh, and then the one that I use most recently is called Ovito. Ovito came from an actual group in Germany. Um, it's, it's not even version 1.0 yet. It's still 0 0.9 something um, on here. But it is meant uh, specifically uh, to read in the data files from the MD simulation code that I use. So it's very useful in that sense. Um, and so it has the capability of reading a couple of different data files from a couple of prominent and basically atomistic simulation codes out there. And what I really like about Ovito is it comes with a whole bunch of tools that allow you to analyze and visualize your system. So kind of as an example of that, uh, this is in basically an actual PDMS nanocomposite, basically simulation that we've been working on. So what you see here is just the raw data. Uh, this is supposed to be polydimethyl siloxane, PDMS. Each of these yellow things here are meant to be copper particles embedded within the PDMS. And what we're actually doing here is we're studying small molecule diffusion through the PDMS nanocomposite. So we're basically diffusing O2 and N2 through our PDMS nanocomposite and extracting diffusion coefficients from our MD simulations. Now, 
our data, basically, basically this is an actual for an actual sensor application that we're working on. Um, so what you see is when you originally read it in, just because you can visualize the data and make it all look like spheres, it doesn't necessarily tell you a heck of a lot about what's actually going on here. So we need ways not only to visualize our system, but also interpret our system. So what we can do with an Oviedo is, for example, if I just look at one kind of, kind of view of my system, uh, I can generate bonds in my system. It can go through and figure out the topology of the system and figure out what is connected to what on here. Still can't really tell too much about what's actually going on here. Uh, if we want to look at the behavior of one chain in our system, we can identify that one chain, which is shown in red here. And then if we want to just really look at that one chain, we can get rid of everything else. So now what you're looking at here is the eight copper nanoparticles in our system. You can see they're faceted with different surfaces. And one PDMS chain as it snakes around the entire simulation model and interacts with those copper nanoparticles. Now I can really look at how the nanoparticles themselves are potentially influencing the chains the actual basically dynamic behavior of the PDMS chains in our system. And then even more importantly, we can do additional tools like we can section our model and look at a two-dimensional slice of our three-dimensional system and look, for example, how this particular PDMS chain wraps itself around the copper basically nanoparticle, essentially self-assembles around that actual nanoparticle so that all of the methyl groups are essentially pointing outwards from that. Uh, and we can study the dynamics by just basically playing this movie in time. We can study the dynamics of how this chain behaves relative to a chain in the bulk of PDMS. So again, the visualization tool not only allows us to view our system, but also to analyze and interpret the science in our system. Uh, yeah, so nanoparticle interaction uh, with, our, with our chain. So kind of in conclusion, uh, essentially, um, it, I hope it's clear from the calculation how cyber infrastructure impacts our ability or basically my ability to do atomistic or basically molecular simulations. Um, and in, in my opinion, it's not just one piece. We need hardware, of course. We need lots of processors to do these problems. We need software to actually do our simulation. The software I, I use is called LAMPS. It's free and openly distributed from uh, Sandia National Labs. Uh, we need visualization software to be able to analyze our system. Uh, and then probably most importantly, we need support personnel. We need people, I by no means have the experience to monitor um, uh, and, and make sure that the, the high performance computing hardware and the actual visualization hardware is up and running and running in the most efficient fashion on here. So support personnel might be the most important out of all of this. Uh, so, uh, basically just thanking some of my students on here uh, and then most of the work that I do, uh, both what I've talked about here and other work is, is uh, basically National Science Foundation has been very good to me. I also have some funding from Oak Ridge Associated Universities uh, and also the University of Arkansas. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions about atomistic simulations if you have them. Yes. Yes. Okay, so you might get quantum mechanical tunneling across the barrier then, maybe. Uh, yes. And that's something, so again, one of the fundamental assumptions behind atomistic or basically classical atomistic simulations of this type is we are lumping all of our electrons in with this one point mass. And this inner atom potential is writing our interaction that is trying to mimic the behavior of those two atoms basically with each other. So there are certain um, properties that are associated with electrons, basically uniquely associated with electrons, that classical atomistic simulations cannot do. We need uh, things like quantum chemistry, we need density functional theory uh, to give us that level of resolution. Hmm. Is that an electronic uh, potential well or a nuclear, like an internuclear? It's strictly atomistic. <laughs> Oh, so, so, so the picture that I showed there was just basically representative of maybe some just too well potential energy surface on there. So it would be, I guess, nuclear in that sense. <laughs>